All right, so as we celebrate our three-year anniversary as a church here, I thought it would be appropriate to kind of reflect a little bit on the past of this church, where we started, and a little bit about where we're going. And the sermon will be geared towards how we're going to continue to move forward as a church. And whether or not you're a part of our church or a member of our church doesn't matter. It's all biblical principles that are going to apply ultimately to serving the Lord with your life. So it, it, you don't have to be in this physical church to do that. So you'll, everyone's going to be able to learn and take away from, from the sermon this morning. But uh, I just want to start off by thanking God for all the work that he's been doing in this church. Because, you know, in the three years that we've been in existence, God has brought together a great group of people. People that love the Lord. And, and I'm very much appreciative of that as, as someone who, who has come here to, you know, help establish this church and plant this church to have so many people that are willing to uh, put in the work and put in the effort or dedicated to serving God. We all have the same goals and the same vision. We have the same faith that unites us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we have you know, similar values of, of what's important. Uh, everyone here, I think, values the, the gospel and the preaching of the gospel, and, and that is the unifying bond, I think, specifically with our church and, and that's what I try to explain to people when we go out and talk to people, when we go out and preach the gospel. You know, why should you come to our church? There's churches all over the place in Georgia, all over the place. Every, I mean, every corner, and not just churches, there's Baptist churches everywhere. But the thing that, that I think sets us apart, the biggest thing is the focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and getting the gospel out to the lost. And I try to explain to people, this is the lifeblood of our church. This is what we're, you know, we're, we're living, eating, breathing, sleeping the gospel. At least we ought to be. That's, that's the, the driving factor is we know how important it is. We know how important it is for people to get saved. And we know that if we don't do something, if we don't take the responsibility that God has given us seriously, that God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, that we can go out and reconcile people to God through Jesus Christ, point people to the Savior, help them understand that, look, that is primary, that is essential, yes. and if we're not doing that, then what good is it? Then church just turns into a social club. Yeah, right. Now, there's nothing wrong with social clubs, right? You could go and have fun and, and fellowship and everything else. That's great, but that's not the whole purpose of the church. You get some fellowship from church, absolutely. We should be edifying, encouraging, and loving. But you know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10? I was just talking about this yesterday with somebody about the importance of church and, and why it's so important to get plugged into church, which, of course, Hebrews 10 gives us the exhortation that we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, that, first of all, being in church is very vital. And if you don't go to church... On a regular basis, you end up just forsaking the assembly. That's a sin. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, and on and on and on. But the Bible says we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Assembling of ourselves together, this is church. It's where we're at right now. You're in the assembly. We're not supposed to forsake this assembly. And why? Because it says in the verse previous, let us consider one another. So we're thinking about one another. We're, we're considering one another. And in order to provoke unto love and to good works, we are to encourage each other to do good, to do right, to go out there and to help other people, to help bring the lost to Christ. This is part of the reason of church is to, is to go and do the good things. Not just solely for fellowship and enjoying one another's company, although that is part of it. We get encouraged and edified by being together. We're going to have some edification as a church today, even after church service, enjoying meals together, breaking bread, and, and being able to have that company. But you know what? If that's all we ever did, what good does that do to the lost? We have to be mindful of the lost. Jesus was, thank God, Jesus was mindful of the lost. And he went about seeking and saving those that were lost. That was his mission. 
And if we're going to be Christians, and if we're going to take the name of Christ and say, I'm going to follow Christ, then we ought to do like he did and be mindful of the lost and go forward bearing precious seed, going forward preaching the gospel, going forward being a light to shine in a dark world, going forward bringing hope to a lost generation and bringing people to Christ and getting them plugged in and seeing lives transformed through the power of God. There's no way I would be standing here today if it wasn't for, one, the power of God in my life, being able to transform my life, change me, mold me, fashion me in what God wants me to be, and, and the assistance of a man or men, people having influence, helping guide me along in God's path. God uses people as human instruments to help accomplish his will. He's given his people jobs to do. Yes, the power of transformation comes from God. However, people are vital in that equation. People need, are, are, need to be there to be used. That's, he's given us jobs. Church is extremely important for that. And I thank God for working through the people in our church. I thank God for the unity we have in the faith of understanding the importance of the gospel because that is really what it's all about. And when we, you know, when you hear the preaching on sin, when you hear me slamming down my fist and raising up my voice and getting mad and angry and, and calling all manner of sin, why does that even matter? Well, it's going to help make you a better Christian, a better soul winner. God's going to use you even more because you're going to be a vessel unto honor and not unto dishonor, as the Bible says. So that you could be used that much more mightily by God. The cleaner you are, the more righteous you are in your day-to-day, -day, the better your witness is going to be, the better your testimony is going to be, because people are going to look at you and see, wow, this isn't just some hypocrite who wants to say all this stuff from the Bible, but they don't live it at all. And that destroys your testimony. That's why, hey, no, look, we treat this seriously. We treat the word of God seriously. Hey, I, I, don't just, I don't just give lip service, oh yeah, the Bible's the word of God, and then just go off and live my life as if I've never even read this book. I mean, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. Do you really believe that or not? You want to hear from God? People go, oh, I just want to know what God has for me. Oh, I just want you know, and, and they'll say all this stuff about God, and I, and I want to have this great relationship with God, and I, you know, and they never open up the book once. Right. Yeah. You want to know? You want to know about God? You want to get close to God? He wants to get close to you. Amen. He wants you to hear from him. Good. But he's already given you his word. It's already right here. It's right here. It's in the pages of this book. Amen. God, I love this church. And I want to see this church continue to do great things. I want to see God continue to move in this church. And I'll tell you what, we're just at the beginning. But just a summary, and this is one of the reasons why I like keeping track of it. You're sitting through announcements, especially if you're a visitor, you're saying, you know, some people get turned off by, oh, why are you putting the numbers in, you know, in the bulletin and counting up and, you know, who, you know how many people get saved and stuff. You don't get the credit for that. You get glory. God gets the glory. Look. We know that Jesus is the Savior, and we're honoring and exalting that. But you know what? It's also encouraging to hear that there's other people in the church going out and preaching the gospel to people. And when we count up numbers, it's not just to be seen of men saying, oh, I'm so holy, and I got these people saved. It's because collectively as a church, we like to know about this. We like to pray for those people. We want to know that, that there's still work being done. It's encouraging to hear other people. Maybe some people haven't been going out to work. You say, wow. These people are all finding time to go out and preach the gospel. Maybe I can do that too. It's encouraging. It ought to be encouraging. It's not a self-exalting thing. And if you think it's a self-exalting thing, come out with us when we go and preach the gospel. If you think it's just 
If you think it's just to be seen and people just want to act spiritual, come out with us. If you think we're just going through and just trying to get people to pray with us so we can say, oh, we've got an extra number, come out with us. Because I despise that type of soul winning where people say, oh, we're getting all these people saved, and you're not really going through the gospel with people. You're not explaining it to them. You're not making it simple. You're not helping them understand what you need to understand to be saved. You need to understand the permanency, the eternality of eternal life. That the, the, the free, free, free grace that's given to us by Jesus Christ because he made the payment for us on the cross. Look, we try to explain that to the best of our ability and we take as much time as is necessary with people because it is important because it's not just about numbers. But you know what? Every single one of those numbers that we, that we put in the bulletin represents a soul. A person they all have names they're all individuals lives that are changed now because somebody humbled themselves to serve the Lord and go forward and preach the gospel and that's what we need more of so I'm not ashamed to put numbers in the bulletin it's motivating and that's the purpose of it I mean there's a reason why the Apostle Paul says I'm become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So we say, oh, how many people did you get saved? That's biblical terminology. It's not taking away from what Jesus does and his power. Of course, we're pointing people to Jesus. He's the Savior. But we're using the same type of language that the Apostle Paul used. And it's not just that one passage. It's multiple places in Scripture. How is it that you get someone saved? Well, because we're pointing people to the Savior. And God has given us that job to do. It's, we, we have to do that. So we're partakers. The Bible says that ye are God's husbandry. We are his workers. We are, we are to go forth and labor for the Lord. He gives the increase. But we need to plant. We need to sow. We need to do everything that we can to help that process out. It's not that God needs help. It's the way he designed it. It's not that he needs, you know, something from us inherently because he's incapable of it. No, of course he's capable of it. But when God designs things a certain way, he says, well, that's the way it's going to be, and that's the way it is. And the way God designed it is that a human being needs to go forward and preach the word of God, as Romans 10 says very clearly, that, hey, salvation is just by believing. Well, then why do you need a person? Because how shall they hear without a preacher? How are you going to believe unless you hear? You don't even know what to believe unless you hear the gospel. And how are you going to hear unless there's a preacher? You're not going to. It's all vital. Now, look, I, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. <laughs> I'm going to go on, go on off on a, on a rabbit trail. But you know what? This is what the church is all about. This is what Strong Old Baptist Church is all about. This is what we're founded on. And this is what we're going to continue doing. And this is, you know, as far as, as, as long as I'm here, as long as I'm going to be the under-shepherd running things here, that's what we're going to do. And, and if I ever stop doing that, then someone needs to smack me in the face. I say, Pastor Burzins, wake up. Get right with God. Remember the first works. And I'm giving you permission right now. If I stop our soul winning program and stop doing the, the first works to come up to me, and, and smack me upside my head because I might need that. And if I don't listen from that, then you know what? You're going to need a spirit-filled preacher to come and, and, and take my place and get back to the first works. We keep track of the numbers. It's, it's encouraging. Since this church started... I tallied up. Obviously, we don't know every single person's heart. You know, we go based off of what they say. So this number is an estimate. It's our best guess. It's our best estimate. It's based off of what someone's saying. If someone's confessing with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and they're calling on the name of the Lord, we can't see their heart, but why would we just think that they're lying? So we count those people. And you know what? There's a lot of people we don't count. 
that very well may get, have gotten saved. We try to be conservative because we don't want to get into this showboating type of an attitude or anything like that. We were very critical. But as the church started, I counted up, I, I went through the numbers, 2,421 people are reported as receiving Christ. And praise God, that's in three years. And we're just getting started. For a three-year-old church to reach that many people, hey, be encouraged by that. But we don't want to just coast and just say, well, that's great. Now, you know, we did our job. No, we need to keep pushing forward. We need to keep doing more. We need to keep driving and, and trying to increase and add more disciples and, and get more people plugged into doing the good works. But, I mean, hey, it's a time to celebrate as a three-year anniversary. This is great. Praise God for using us to reach so many individuals. Because that's a lot of individuals. There's a lot of people there. Not just, not just the salvations. Even our attendances have been slowly, steadily increasing. You say, Pastor, we're still a small church. I know. And that's great. But for a three-year-old church, I think we're doing really good. I think we're doing really good. God has been bringing people and adding people. And you know what I love about it is that the people who God is bringing to our church are people who are really serious about church. And, and it's another thing I just love about it is that, you know, people, obviously we want as many people that are interested in the Lord and want to grow and have a desire to come. And everyone's going to be at different levels of spirituality, of course. And you never look down on people for where they're at. But what we want to see is people who want to grow no matter where they're at. So if they're a brand new baby believer that just got saved today, great. We want to see you grow. We want to help you grow. We want to encourage you and, and help motivate you to, to, to learn more and grow more. And you know what? That growth takes Time. People don't just change on a dime overnight and just all of a sudden you had all these problems and now everything's gone. Now, in salvation, yeah, you're saved eternally. In that sense, it's a one-time event. You're saved forever. But you still have baggage from the past. You still have a sinful flesh. You still have sinful desires that you need to now work at overcoming. And it takes time. And anything that's done Right? Anything that's unbiblical is going to take time. For our church to really become a powerhouse of people serving the Lord, it's going to take time. If we just sprout it up overnight and just, wow, now we're running thousands and we just got started, we're probably not doing something right. Probably. Now, obviously, there's exceptions to the rule. But typically, in what we see even naturally, you know, weeds sprout up overnight. But they're not very valuable, are they? They're a hindrance. But the big oak trees, or the plant, even just the good plants that are producing plants, they take time. You start with that seed. I mean, you want an apple tree, you want an orange tree, you want something that's going to produce some good fruit, and you start with a seed, it's going to take time from that new life that comes out of the seed, just like a new Christian who's born again. It's going to need time to be nurtured, developed, growing, and then start becoming fruitful and more fruitful and more fruitful into a mature tree. And we want a mature church. It's going to take some time, but thank God we have been growing. We have been growing. And even with last year's pandemic, with, with absolutely had an impact on attendances, and I would say for good reasons for many people, like there, you know, there's a lot of people who have high risk to disease and, and we're very uncertain about, about the details and everything. Of course, I mean, we shut down last year for I forget exactly how long, a few weeks, a month, something like that, with the in-person services because we didn't know all the details. We didn't know how, how serious and how deadly and all these other things. But even through that, because that affects our attendance records, but when I'm going back and looking at this, I'm going, you know, we still had a lot more than our first year that we started. Even with just a month of, of like, basically no attendance, 
bringing the averages down, and we continue to see growth year after year after year. There, and I'm not going to bore you with the numbers. I actually have them printed out here, but it doesn't matter the, the actual exact number because God's going to build the church anyways, and God can use very few to do a great work. But we like to see the growth. We want to see God adding more people to our church. We want to see that continue. We want to see the reaching of the lost, not just with the gospel, but then helping to disciple into becoming uh, a soul winner themselves, into serving the Lord to the utmost of their ability. Everybody has talents. Everyone has abilities that God has given you. We need to, to fashion ourselves and mold ourselves by, by getting right with God so he could use us to the best of the abilities he's given us already. Now, I'm not going to ask everything specifically, but how many people in this church have slipped up your hand if you've either learned soul winning at this church or you've drastically improved your soul winning here? Amen. Amen. Ha at least half the hands up in this room. That's encouraging to me. You know what that means? That means, that means there's people growing. There's people improving. There's people doing more. Okay, that was just soul winning. How about this? And again, we don't need to know every specific, but if you fall into any one of these categories, how many people here have made changes in their lives by either reading your Bible more, soul winning more, getting sin out of your life, making positive, life-altering decisions since you've been attending this church as a result of attending this church? Amen. Amen. You know what? Praise God. Praise God for this church and praise God for all the people who have made those decisions and those impacts to, to become better Christians. And you know what? We're not stopping there, though. We want to continue to reach people and do more and continue to learn and continue to grow. Let's rejoice in the Lord and the victories he's wrought. We also need to take heed lest we fall. While we rejoice, we take heed. We stay humble. And you say, it's easy to stay humble when we're small. But this is an attitude that we need to maintain even as if God decides to pour out blessings and we have a huge growth. Stay humble. Stay humble. Stay the course. Keep the same spirit. Because when you start getting haughty, pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We need to always return to the Lord who is our stronghold in the day of trouble. We started off in Nahum chapter 1, and the reason why, again, is because our church verse is in number 7, and we don't ever want our church to be the object that gets above the Lord. We are a stronghold here, and a stronghold is a defense. A stronghold is a place that you could go to and... and and have a defense set up, right? And, and you can be well protected. But you know what? Ultimately, the Lord is our stronghold. And that's why verse 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. We want to represent the place where believers can gather together to trust in the Lord. Because the Lord is our stronghold. We want to have that, that physical presence here on earth, as a stronghold for people who are, are zealous, for people who believe the word of God and want to live that life and want to do and serve the Lord, hey, come to Stronghold Baptist Church and be part of this stronghold, this outpost in this area of the world to serve the Lord. But you know what? We never can let that, that name or this building or this, you know, be getting all of the glory. You know what? God is the stronghold. He's our defender. He's our protector. Turn, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter number 6. We're going to get into some of the teaching now on just being strong in the Lord. We, gotta, we need to be able to stay the course. We need to be able to make sure that as much as God has blessed us, as much victories have been won already, that we can continue to stay in the fight, continue to move forward, because the Christian life has its ups and downs. And the longer you're in the life, the more you're going to see the ups and the downs. And the downs are going to make you want to quit. But we need to stay the course. 
We need to stay, be strong in the Lord and get our strength from the Lord. And what we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 6 is the armor of God. And one thing I want to point out about the armor of God, about how we need to be equipped, about how we need to have our strength from the Lord is the whole point of all the armor of God, and we're going to see this mentioned verse after verse, time after time, is to be able to stand, to be able to stand, to be able to stand, to be able to stand. It's not even to push forward and get on all these attacks and offenses. Just be able to stand. Be able to stand. Be able to stand on the word of God. Be able to stand for the truth. Be able to not be knocked down and continue progressing slowly forward, moving on Onward, Christian soldiers, steady pace moving forward. I love zeal. I love seeing people get excited. But you always have to just, in the back of your mind, be able to understand that you can never maintain, you know, pedal to the metal, full steam ahead all the time of being super sold out, zealous, oh man, I'm going to spend this whole, I'm going to take a month off of work and I'm going to go out every single day and preach the gospel. Hey, that's great and God bless you, but you know what? It, there's going to be a point where you can't keep up an insane pace. And you may think, man, I've done all this work for God. But if you end up quitting and fizzling out because you've just ran yourself completely into the ground, you're going to end up having done way less than someone who has been consistent faithful, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, putting in your time, just, just staying committed and staying strong and keeping your strength in the Lord, that's a lifetime. That's a marathon. It's not just a sprint. Keep the end game in mind. We need to, yes, push ourselves. Yes, I love the challenges. Yeah, I want to be able to always try to do some more and get get the most, to squeeze the most out as we can to, to, to serve God with. But don't jump in expecting all this change and then being able to maintain, you know, some crazy level. And I hope I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm kind of not being extremely specific on that, but you know what I mean. You see people who get really excited and, man, I'm listening to all this preaching every day and all this stuff and everything is, is just 24-7, God, 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 which is, you know what, great. And, and I, I'm not, I don't want to put a wet blanket on that. Believe me, I don't. Because I think it's great. I think it's wonderful when people get like that. But when you do get like that, if, you come, you know, if, if that's where you're at right now, just make sure that you're going to be able to stay in it. Amen. And when things are forced to slow down a little bit because you're running so fast, don't get out. Don't just quit. Don't burn out. And one of the ways is when we think about the armor of God. Look at verse number 10 in Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Almighty God, we can rest in his might, rest in his power, and be strong through the Lord. And how are we going to do that? Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because here's the fact. When you want to live a righteous life, when you just want to live a clean life, I want to do what's right. You decide, you know what? I want to do what's right by God. I want to live the way God would have me to live. You know what happens right away, virtually right away? You're going to run into opposition. You're going to run into temptation. You're going to run into people who are going to try to get you not to do that especially the more history you have not living for God, the faster it's going to be where people are going, hey, just come on out to the bar with me. Hey, just come on, do this. Hey, come on, do whatever your vice was, whatever it was that, that, was, that you've been struggling with, and you decide today, you know what? No, I'm going to do what's right. Guess what's coming? Opposition. Guess what's coming? Temptation. Guess what's coming? The devil knocking at your door. Because he doesn't want you to live for God. So one, be aware of that. Having that knowledge alone is important because it can help you to prepare. Say, I know this is going to come. So I need to find my strength in the Lord, in the power of his might, 
pray unto God, get on your knees, be humble, say, God, help me through this. Because I have a lot of temptations. I have, I have, a, I have a flesh that wants me to, to draw away from you. And God says, okay, son, okay, daughter, here's what you need to do. You need to put on the armor so you're protected. Here's what you need to be able to do to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 explains, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are, the, these are where our battle is. It's all around us. It's a spiritual battle, spiritual wickedness, and it comes from very high places too, people who have authority. And for this reason, the Bible says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. So we saw in verse 11 that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We see in verse 13 that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And then it, it, it mentions again, and having done all, to stand. God just says, I want you to be able to stand. So you put on this armor so you can stand, so you can just stay there, so you don't fall down. So you don't stumble, you don't trip. Now, if you do stumble and trip, get back up again. But you know what? God wants you to stand, so let's look at the armor. Verse 14, again, stand therefore. And here's where he starts listing off the armor. Having your loins girt about with truth. So you got to put on that girdle, that belt of the truth. The truth is important. You want to, being able to stand against the opposition, against the wiles of the devil, you need the truth on your side. Because when you're easily deceived, when you don't know what's true, here comes the devil and trying to tell you, oh, well, this is true. Oh, well, that's true. Okay, well, then I'll go that way. You need the truth. Thank God he's given us the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word. We got the word of God. We have got the Holy Spirit. You're born again. That can lead you into all truth. Get in the word so you can have that truth on your side. To help give you the knowledge that you need to be prepared against the attacks of the devil. Having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, doing right. The more you can improve that breastplate of righteousness, the better off you're going to be able to stand, right? When you're failing at just, you know, at, at getting victories over sin, you're going to continue, it's, it's going to be harder and harder to stand. Does that make sense? It's going to be harder and harder to stand when you're, when, you're, when you're not able to start living righteously. The more righteousness you add, the, the, the better you're going to be able to stand. Because there's less attacks to come at you. You're, you're, you're opened up. You've got plenty of places to stumble and fall. The less righteousness you have. The more sinful you are the easier it is to find holes and to be able to bring you down and to get you out of the fight when you're just involved in all kinds of sin. So living righteously and having that righteousness is going to help you against the wiles of the devil. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the perspiration of the gospel of peace. Now, why is, why is the gospel of peace, you know, talking about your feet? Because we're supposed to go forth and preach the gospel to every creature. So part of our armor is doing good by serving others. Now, you say, how is that even a defense? How? How does that even make any sense? Why would, why would that, preaching the gospel of peace to other people, have anything to do with my defense? Well, it helps eliminate some idle time. The Bible says, you know, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're doing right, when you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going out and sinning. When you're going forward with the gospel of peace, that leaves a lot of other time that you could be out doing bad. You're not doing that anymore. 
But then above all, verse 16 says, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So the Bible's saying here, you know what? The wicked are going to be throwing darts at you, shooting arrows at you, trying to pierce you, trying to get you to stop, to stop standing, to stop standing for the Lord. They're going to try to get you to stop. That's why you need the shield of faith. Faith is important. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen. So our whole motivation and, and, and what we're revolving our lives around is ultimately things that are, that are not seen because it's the word of God. We're trusting that the Lord is there, even though we physically don't see God. We're putting our trust in God to be our defender. So when you're surrounded by the enemy, and you can see so many examples in scripture of this, where Elisha is surrounded, right, by all these enemies. Why did they not get the victory over him? Because he had faith in God. He had faith knowing that, hey, you know what? God's my defender. God will see me through this. But when you have those lapses in faith, when you're not trusting completely in the Lord, you know what? That's when the victory is going to have an open door to be able to come in and then you don't get the victory. See, God's looking for people that are faithful to defend. He's not requiring necessarily anything from you other than just, hey, put your trust in him. He'll show himself strong. You are putting yourself out there in a sense because you might be out there unprotected physically on your own. But the shield of faith it's invisible, but it's there and very real. I mean, we're trusting. That's why salvation is by faith, right? It's by grace through faith. We're trusting that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. No one here saw that. No one here witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we're trusting in that. We've staked our souls on that. I'm all in on Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, for me to go to heaven. 100% all in on that. So if I'm all in on that, which is something I haven't seen, something I haven't personally witnessed, how much more is God going to be able to defend you and protect you and you'll be able to have that shield when you trust in him to win your victories for you, to be able to protect you, just to be able to defend you? Of course he can. Of course he can, but it takes your faith to be able to not get knocked down because even when things around you seem to be going all sideways and, and weird and bad and my like, man there's all these problems happening maintain that faith because that will protect you God will protect you verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation that's important. I mean, that protects your head, right? That's a, that's a vital area that you'd never want to have exposed, that helmet of salvation. Without that, I mean, you could be destroyed. Obviously, we need salvation. Extremely important. I'm not going to spend too much time going into that. And then the sword of the Spirit, where the Bible says here, which is the Word of God. This is the only thing of all the armor here that could even be used as an offensive and as a defensive item, right? The sword of the Spirit. And, and what is that? It's the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We need faith. We need the helmet of salvation. We need the gospel of peace. We need truth. We need righteousness to stand. And this is every Christian needs these pieces to be able to continue moving forward to be able to stay in the fight, to be able to stand, to not get knocked down, to not be backslidden and, and get back into the world. Focus on these things. Maintain this so you can continue to stand. The Bible says in verse 18, then praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit 
and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I, I'm closing out with this verse because this just highlights, it accentuates what we just read, the Apostle Paul's teaching on the armor of God, and then informs us, oh yeah, by the way, please continue to pray for me. I need your prayers, because I need to continue to speak boldly. Why? Because I'm in jail right now. I'm in bonds for preaching the gospel, and if you're in a position like that, he said, you know, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to preach the gospel. I'm trying to do what's good, and here I am in jail. And for, for people, if you don't have the armor of God, that could cause you to say, you know what? This isn't worth it. You know what? I don't like being in jail. I want this to stop. I don't like being treated this way. And if I don't say anything anymore, then maybe I could just go back to a normal life. That's what gets people out of the fight. You know what? I don't like the drama. You know what? I don't like people you know, coming after me. I don't like people not liking me. I don't like being hated by so many people because I'm standing on the word of God. You know, it's easier just not to say anything. I'll just focus on making money. I'll just focus on being comfortable. I'll just focus on doing this. And then I could just be happy and pretend like, you know, well, whatever. I mean, people don't want to hear this anyways. And I could tell myself whatever lies I want to tell myself. You've lost all your armor. And don't think child of God, that God isn't going to chasten you and discipline you, don't be deceived into thinking that once you start down that path of serving the Lord, that things are just going to be roses for you if you quit, if you stop. Because that's why people want to quit, because they just think, well, you know, I'm tired of all the fighting and battle. You know what? You are not going to find the joy and the peace that you long for that you think you don't have because of all the problems? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. That comes from being in the Spirit. And when you're not walking in the Spirit and standing on the Word of God, you're not going to get the fruit of the Spirit. The joy, the peace, these things. You can have that while you're being persecuted through your faith and continue. It's not always easy, but it's vital. And just imagine, I mean, what if the Apostle Paul just threw in a towel and called it quits? What a shame that would be. I mean, talk about someone who, who has done so much for the cause of Christ, humanly speaking, just in this world, someone who's, who's dedicated his life to preaching the gospel and getting people saved, then how many people would have been affected if one of these times Paul's cast in prison and he says, you know what, forget it. There's a lot of people that would be not then having received the same gift that he received. We need to stay in it. It's vital. Turn, if you would, please, to Psalm 62. We need to stay strong. We need to be able to stand. We need to stay strong in the Lord. Psalm 62. One of the things that's important, you don't have to be a trailblazer and light the whole world on fire through all of your actions. How about you just focus on being able to stand? You don't need to find all the fights to fight. You start standing on God, standing on the Bible, the fights will come to you. Don't worry about it. If you're, if you're just humbly trying to serve the Lord, the fights will come. They will come. You just prepare yourself, prepare your defenses, get your armor built up to continue to stand. Stand for what's right. Stand for the truth. And in our modern culture, you know, people who do believe the right thing, people who are against this 
filthy wickedness and vile affections that are going on that are being promoted in the world today, they don't, they're not wearing their armor. Because nowadays, too many people are more concerned about their financial well-being if they actually stand on the word because they don't have the faith that God will take care of them. So they think that, oh, I better not say anything because I'll get canceled. I better not say anything. I might lose my job. I better not say anything about this wickedness that's abounding. I better not say anything because then people could get mad at me. I better not say anything or else the alphabet animals are going to come after me and they're going to target me and they're going to cause my, make my life miserable. And the more people don't stand, they stand down, you're opening up the door for all the vile wickedness that's coming into our country and destroying it. Because you're unwilling to stand. Because you haven't been keeping up on listening to God. You haven't been in the word. You didn't gird up the truth on your loins. It's sitting in your closet. You got the truth. You know what it says. You're not wearing it. You're not doing anything with it. You've hung it out to dry. And you've stood down. Your armor needs to be on you at all times. We need to stand. Resistance. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yep, it is. Welcome to the Christian life. Yeah, the Christian Christ life. Hey, do you think Jesus Christ's life was comfortable? Did Jesus live this life on earth to be comfortable? To sit in an air-conditioned house? Watch TV. Eat nice food. Did Jesus do that? No. Then why do you think that your life should just be comfortable all the time? He had no home. He walked out. He stayed up all night praying. He walked out. He healed people. He was helping people. He suffered. He was lied about. People hated him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They beat him up. They spit in his face, and they nailed him to a cross. You want to call yourself a Christian? How about you stand? How about you stand for what he stood for unto death? You're going to call him your Savior? Why don't you try walking in his footsteps too? Call yourself a Christian. doesn't even take very many to make that stand but people need to make the stand oh I don't want to deal with that coward shame shameful Christian Would to God we had people at the heart of the disciples that said we ought to obey God rather than man. I'm not going to fear what man could do unto me. I'm going to fear what God could do unto me. Christians today are too scared of no soliciting signs. The Apostle Paul was thrown into jail. We're supposed to obey the laws. The Apostle Paul was thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. And you're worried about a no soliciting sign? Hey, God commanded you to preach the gospel to every creature, which is why when we go out and knock on doors and talk to people and preach the gospel, people are like, oh, you're not supposed to be here. I have permission to be here. I have permission. It's okay. God's given me permission to go out and knock on your door. I do. And what greater authority do you have? Confrontational soul winning. You better believe it is. Because that's the way that Jesus did it. That's the way he sent his disciples out to do it. I'm not going to pretend to know more than he knows. Psalm 62, verse number 1. But it says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. 
He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. When God is our defense, when God is our rock, when God is our trust, when God is our salvation, you don't have to worry about being moved. He says in verse number two, I shall not be greatly moved. But let's keep reading. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. This is talking about people imagining mischief against him, right? People are devising evil against him, and he's saying, you know what? You're going to be slain, all of you. You're going to be destroyed as a tottering fence. Verse 4, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. These are wicked people. They're going to be coming against you if you're living for God. Verse 5, my soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. This is the attitude we need to have. Hey, I'm going to wait on you, God. I'm going to trust in you. These people are all out. They're saying one thing out of their mouth, and in their heart, they want to destroy. Look at verse 6. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Started from going in verse 2. I shall not be greatly moved. I shall not be moved. In verse 6. Not going to be moved. God's our defense. God is our stronghold. Don't be moved. Don't let this world move you. Don't let this world silence you and make you back down on stands that God has in the scripture. Don't back down. Rest in God. Hey, God's the one that said it. If you're going to stand for it, look, you're not making the stand for yourself. When you stand on God's word, it's not like, well, it's me against all these people because, you know, I have this opinion or whatever. Look, you're standing on what God said. So if you stand on what God said, why wouldn't he defend his words through you? Of course he will. You can trust and not be moved because if you're just standing on God's word, you're just a messenger. You're just a messenger. That's what we are. We're messengers. I didn't come up with all of these things. I didn't come up with, with God's morality, moral teachings on what's right, what's wrong. I didn't make this stuff up. It didn't come out of my own heart. I found it in here. You found it in here. So if you stand on that, you can't go wrong. You see what's happening in this world today, and you go, wait a minute. <laughs> no. Wait a minute. No. And then you could stand, because here's what it says right here. Here's what God had to say about it. You're wicked. This is what God said about it. Stand on that. That's a solid foundation to stand on. It's his word. Turn to Matthew 4. It's the last place I'll have you look. We're almost done. We'll close on this, on this story because we're going to see how this plays out in real life. See, we have saw these verses on having the armor of God. We saw Psalm 62 about God being your defense. And the whole point is to be able to stand. We need to be able to withstand. The attacks are going to come. We need to stay strong. We need to be able to stand. The Bible says in James chapter 4, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So if you're able to stand, if you're able to resist, if you're able to just keep the armor of God, stay protected, you know what? The attacks are going to come, but then they're going to go. The attacks are not permanent forever, just continual all the time. It's only for a season. It's a short period of time. They come and they go. So when they come, don't get so upset and quit thinking, oh, this is never going to end. This is terrible. Stay with it because it will go away. It will pass. It's going to come again, but then it's going to pass. You get relief. You get breaks. God is not going to allow you to go through anything that you are incapable of handling anyway, so just stay faithful and stay true. He'll get you through. If you give up thinking that's going to end your problems, it's only going to create more anyways. It's better to just stick with it. Stay faithful. It'll strengthen your testimony. It's going to strengthen your faith because you're going to see once you stay through it and it passes, you're actually going to be edified going, wow, whew, I made it through that. So then the next time it comes around, you're going to be even stronger because you're going to be able to go, wow, well, I've been through this already once before. I've been through this before. I've been through this before. 
and it builds your confidence. As you, as you see God at work in your life because you don't fail on him, because you just stay faithful to God, I'm relying on you. I'm going to help, you know, help me through this. And you see it through to the end, you get more confidence because you see, wow, hey, God's word came true. And it's not that it's necessarily a shock or surprising because you have the faith, but it's really reassuring to see it be confirmed over and over again. And I'll tell you what, the longer I live my life and the more experience I get and the more stands I take and the more I see God working, the more I love God and the deeper and deeper and deeper respect I have and, and, the, and the more committed I get. Because you just continue to see the truth play out over and over and over again and it's self-confirming like yep hey god's right again hey the bible is true again yep there we go we see this happening there we go bible's true it's right funny thing about the truth it's always true it's great when you can see it so we see the the Example of how, how this plays out about resisting the devil with Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus in the wilderness. He goes, he goes out. He's away from everybody. He's out on his own. All right? There's no one there supporting him. He's, he's gone out in the wilderness. And he's fasting. So physically, he's going to be in a weakened state, physically. He's not, he's not having regular food, right? He's, he's withholding from himself. His body is, is a little bit, is going to be desirous of eating. It's going to be desirous of, of fulfilling the lusts that are building up because he's withholding from himself. This is the condition that Jesus is in. And this is the moment that Satan uses to try to come in and tempt Jesus, right? He's going to come and test him. Not when he's at his strongest. He's going to try to come in at your weakest, Satan's going to come in and try to get you right after you get saved. Before you've really started building and growing and getting cemented in your faith and getting plugged in, he's going to try to get you out right away. So I, don't want, I don't want this person getting just grounded and found in the truth. Things are going well for you in your life. Other circumstances come up and happen and start causing all kinds of turmoil and confusion. And you're having problems at work or problems at home. That's going to be the time that he's going to step in. Why? Because he's going to see that you're weaker and try to get you at that moment all the more uh, time to be able to resist. Jesus was targeted while he was fasting for 40 days in the desert. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. So he was hungry. You go 40 days and 40 nights without eating, you'll be hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So what's the first thing he's tempting him with? Food. He knows he's hungry. He knows he wants to eat. So he's saying, well, hey, hey, if you're the Son of God, why don't you just, I mean, you could make those breads, uh, make those stones bread if you want to. You're the Son of God, right? I mean, you've got the power to do that. Why don't you just do that? Go ahead. Prove that you're the Son of God. Hey, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you just do that? Go ahead. Eat some bread testing him he's tempting him trying to get him to fail trying to get him to break his fast before he's done but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God how does he respond how does Jesus respond to the temptation with a verse from the Bible with God's word with the truth and you know what's interesting Every attack from Satan is answered with the word of God. And not just because Jesus is the word, but I mean, he's, he's saying it is written, it is written, it is written. This is scripture. You need to be prepared for the trials, for the temptations, for the attacks with the word of God. Because when you're being tempted, oh man, you do this, you do, you, uh, the devil's coming at you with something. You can say, no. That may feel good for a moment. That may satisfy some desire I have. But no, no, it's written. No, I'm not going to do that. It's written. No, no, God said no. 
Verse 5, the devil, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So now what's the devil doing here? He's trying to use the Bible against him. He's trying to get him to sin by using the Bible, by taking scriptures out of context, by, by trying to, to bring him this and say, oh, well, doesn't the Bible say this, huh? So go ahead and do it. And we need to be mindful of that as well. Because you, you know the devil isn't going to come to you with horns and a, and a, and a pitchfork and red and, and a tail. That's Looney Tunes. <laughs> You're watching too many cartoons. That's not, that's not what the devil looks like. The Bible says that the, that the devil is, is an angel of light. And that his devils, the other fallen angels, are, are, are perceived as, as angels of light. They're going to look good. They're, they're going to actually be highly desirable to look at and beautiful. And, and they're going to come at you with that facade, with that fake appearance. Why? Because inwardly they're, they're out to destroy. That's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to destroy Jesus. He's trying to get him to fail. But man, he's going to come at him looking real good. Oh man, but the Bible says this. That's why it's incumbent on you to know. That's why you need to be in the Bible every day. So you could say, no, 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 no. I read, I read about that already. You can't deceive me. The Bible says that the, you know, the, the, the slight of men and there's cunning craftiness whereby you know, these false prophets and wicked people lie and wait to deceive. There's another reason why it's important to go to church. You could be being taught doctrine in addition to all the reading you're doing. There's people out there that want to deceive you with scripture. False prophets, they abound. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he answers them again with the word of God. Hey, no, 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 no. It's written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So now he's offering wealth and riches, all this worldly goods and treasures. Well, that, you know what? That's a common temptation of, of Christians too. Hey, don't worship God. Worship me. You'll get money. You'll get fame. You'll get whatever. But deal with the devil. This is not the world that we're focused on. We're not focused on earthly riches. You know what? Everything here is going to burn up. Right. It's a fool's game to think that, oh, well, I'll just do this, and then everything will be great in my life. Look, it's all going to be gone. We need to be eternally minded. There's a new Jerusalem. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And there's rewards that are going to be given that have eternal value from God. Do you want the devil's riches or do you want God's riches? The devil's riches don't last. They'll be taken away. It's going to last you a moment. And what do you sacrifice to give those? Jesus answered, verse 10, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written again, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Get away from me. What you're stinking riches? The Bible says, look, I'm only going to worship the Lord. I'm going to worship you. Then look at what it says in verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Three times. Devil's coming. He's tempting. He's tempting. He's tempting. You know what? It wasn't 103 times. It wasn't this all the time temptation, just, just beating him down to not be able to withstand. No, he resisted, he resisted, he resisted, the devil left. Because the devil sees, okay, he keeps resisting. I'm not going to waste my time in here anymore. I'm going to go and try to find someone else who's not as strong. Be strong in the Lord. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Get the armor on. It may seem difficult while you're going through it. Have the faith to know, hey, this will pass. This will end. Stay with it. Those temptations will stop for a while. Now, you know what? The devil will come back. He'll try again. Be ready for it. 
But the next time he comes back, you'll be a little bit stronger. Because once you've resisted, it builds up some courage, right? It gives you experience, helps you know it's not so bad. I made it through that. And any bad traumatic event you end up going through, while you still remember that it was bad, when you make it through it, you go, you know what, that really wasn't all that bad. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was at the time. You come out the other end, even in horrible situations, you have a different hindsight view than when you're right in the middle of it, which helps you going forward. At this point in my life, just one quick example, and I brought this up before, you know, the thought of losing a job when you have a family to support is a real threat. It's a concern. It could cause anxiety. It could cause you to be nervous, right? What am I going to do? I need to provide for my family. But if you're, if you're losing your job, not because you're some, you know, horrible employee and you're not doing your job and you're lazy, you're not working. Look, not for that. But if you're standing on the word of God and you're worried about, oh, man, these sodomites are going to come and they're going to make me lose my job. Look. You stay faithful to God, and he'll, he'll be faithful to you. If I was to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, God will provide for you. God will make a way. And I would say, test him on that. If you, if you are attacked and you need to make a stand, stand with God, and he will see you through. I've had that decision. And I am glad and thankful that I didn't fail during that time of temptation, even when I did get, lose my job for my belief. Do you know what God did? God blessed me for that. It's entirely capable of happening again. I'd almost be surprised if it didn't happen again in the world that we live in today. Do you know what? Now I'm even more emboldened. Not only, you know, I, I made my decisions because I was having faith in the word of God, saying I know, I know what the Bible says this. That's why I made the decision I made. Having the faith, not having gone through it before the first time, and saying, no, this is right, I'm staying with it. It was uncomfortable, it was stressful, then you got to try to find work, what am I going to do, we don't have that much money. Well, just keep doing, get to work, find something. God leads, God provides, thank you God. You go through that process, guess what, next time, go ahead, fire me, I don't care, whatever. I mean, obviously there's still gonna be some, you know, stress and, and whatever, having to deal with it, but now I've already, God's already proven himself, he's already shown himself. Not that he has to, because I already believe it, but you go through it, it's just like, okay, Fine, bring it on. I don't know where I would find work again, uh, but I'm not going to worry about it. Well, it's going to be harder. I mean, the more times you lose your job, the harder it's going to get to find one. Yeah, maybe, but you know what? If God's looking out for me, I got nothing to worry about. Remember that. Remember that. More important to stand, because life is short. And at the end of the day, we are so stinking rich Overall, in this country, with the blessings that, that, that abound, if I went, I mean, I don't know how long. We could probably go who knows how long without having some, some income. If you continue serving the Lord, okay, maybe I wouldn't have the nice house. So what? Maybe I wouldn't have an extra vehicle. So what? If God sees fit to put me in that spot, then you know what? Praise God. What did Job do when he lost all of his worth, earthly goods and his children? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hey, the Lord's given, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then what did God do? God blessed him in the end, didn't he? He doubled everything. He got a double portion. Why? Because he stayed faithful. Hard times came, and through no fault of Job, they came. The devil attacked him. You stand for God, the devil might attack you too. No, the devil will attack you too. Not might. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
Prepare for it. Prepare for it. Be ready for it. Don't fall. Stay strong in the Lord. Hey, come to church. We'll help you through that. We'll help encourage you because other people have already been through it. You start to face persecution from family members. Oh, you're part of a cult. Oh, you're going out and talking to people. That's crazy. And they want to bring you down and make you stop. Come to church. We've been through it. I've been through it before. I could offer you some comfort. I'll help you out. Plenty of other people here have too. It's amazing to me. There's many people I hear stories about from years ago, and they bring up the same thing. They're like, wow, I didn't even know that was going on, you know, because they didn't make mention of it. But people silently go through their own uh, trials at home. You know what? We're here to encourage you. Keep you motivated. If we can maintain the path we're on, I am confident that God is going to continue to build and grow and work. Because you know what? God's looking for people to use. God's looking for it. You don't have to be the most talented person in the world. You just have to be willing. God will turn you into who he wants you to be and how he wants to use you. Just be willing. Show up. Let's bow our eyes a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Lord, uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for the people here, God. Thank you. Just thank you, Lord. We ask for you to help all of us individually. Lord, help us with our struggles. Help us to stay strong. Help us to, to daily make improvements and to, to try to get closer to you, to the way you'd have us to be. Lord, open up our minds. Help us to, to understand good doctrine. Help us to receive knowledge. Lord, help us to, to work and, and make the changes in our life to be able to, to be more Christ-minded and, and mindful of the lost and, and desirous to, to do your will and to do your work, God. We're here because we love you. God, bless this church. Help us to have a, a stronger church, have more unity, dear Lord, to really be like a well-oiled machine, like a fully functional body that is the body of Christ right here where you're at the head directing our steps, dear Lord. You're directing our paths. We're looking to you, God. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.